Maybe some of those guys. Dumbledore. And Dumbledore would get it wrong, right? <laughs> Gollum turns out to be the, the smart guy. Hopefully they will restart again soon. Otherwise, I will have to find another movie maker. I want to thank everyone for their support and comments. Thank you. Chaos Butterfly 8. Thank you. I will be working on my playlists in the meantime. So this <laughs> maniac, obviously, um, yeah, you get to change all those things, right? So you write a text, and you feed it into the thing, and then it will say it. But you know, depending on how much you pay, you can get different angles and different characters. It's pretty cool. And you can have people talking to each other. Yeah, right. Um, so it was a great idea, but it looks like it didn't take off. Yeah, see, there you go. You can have um, these ones on the side, like cute, cute little characters. Yeah, all those things. Um, yeah, some of these we're not going to show in class. OK. Um, often quite comedic. I don't think it's been used for you know, societal, societal good, not necessarily. Well, I mean, humor is obviously important. Um, OK, so that was, that was pretty great. Uh, yeah, so that's a bit of a shame. I could have done I, We were really into that. Um, let's get rid of this. Come back here. And um, is that exciting? <laughs> this is the, this is this is how bad it is. Yeah. <coughs> so Linux systems were great, right? Because you, I mean, they are great because you can put as many as you want. I used to have thirty, ten by three. What? It's really good because then it's basically, That's but then it's you know. <laughs> true. No, it does enable um, a kind of ADD for sure. But it, 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 that gives you like a, a terrain, a world. So you can have, you know, whatever. Teaching is kind of on this little continent over here. And you actually have desktops that you don't put anything on. They have like a boundary. Yeah. So when you look at the whole thing, you, yeah. But it. Yeah, you can go, yeah. So you can zip around between them like that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah. see, it, it oscillates like that. Right? Cool. I mean, virtual desktops have been around on Unix machines for uh, 30 years or something. So, because Unix is awesome. And uh, it took a long time. Um, uh, what am I getting? OK. I didn't write down a list of things. Uh, I guess there's some on here. Oh, yeah. OK, so episodes. So I, you know, I keep putting these things up. This is from last year. I keep putting up the good stuff. There's a cat in the latest one, because the internet doesn't have enough cat videos. Um, that's why people keep posting them. That's right, yeah, because, you know, yeah, I mean, so that's in there. Fill that void. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just thought, well, you know, why not? What's going on, internet? Just right, fun. Yeah. See? Yeah. That's a pretty smart cat. Um, <laughs> actually, it is a very smart cat. It knows, yeah. So that's the padded get more padded, actually. Is, uh, is there's some terrible lines in there like that. Uh, all right. So today, we're going to talk about Mandelbrot and um, Simon. Uh, we've had Simon's model. We've got a beautiful model, right? So this is a great little thing. It's not, uh, it doesn't apply necessarily to any real thing exactly, but it's a, it's a good facsimile of the basics of mechanisms that we see over and over, these rich get richer phenomena. You can tweak it and change it based on what the, the real world is producing. I'll show you that it does seem to apply quite well to at least the Linux kernel, the Debian version. So that's, that's important. Um, we'll get to that later. <coughs> but the essence of it, right? It's a toy model, if you like, with some nice math that you um, will enjoy. And uh, it's all pretty good. OK. Hmm. What else we got? All right, so I have this little piece here, which is an evolution of catchphrases. Well, we'll see how we uh, how branding works in science here. Uh, so Yule's paper. So the first time this was really talked about well, uh, and clearly, uh, so it's a mathematical theory of evolution based on. So that's that's fantastic. I mean, great title, right? That's great. But then, based on the you know, then it sort of just drops it right there. It's sort of like a, becomes a footnote of sorts, um, <coughs> and it's typical ridiculous English nonsense. 
Yes. Based on the conclusion of Dr. J.C. Willis, if I remember. Very good. Um, so Simon's paper, not a good title, right? This is not a good title. Uh, on a class of skewed, I mean, that just, that's, that is just complete Snorville, and it does not tell you that this is about kind of everything. <laughs> um, I don't know what happened there. However, as soon as you get into the introduction, it's all good, right? So it is the purpose of this paper to analyze a class of these functions. That's, you're still asleep. You're struggling. That appear in a wide range of empirical data. You can kind of pick up a little bit. Your heart rate gets a little. And particularly data describing sociological, biological, and economic phenomena. You're like, really? Go on. You know, like, <laughs> go on. Um, uh, its appearance is so frequent, the phenomena are so diverse, that one is led to conjecture that if these phenomena have any property in common, it can only be a similarity in the structure of the underlying probability mechanisms. Well done. You know, that's great. All right? So we're off. And then he talks about f a list of five different things, which I mentioned the other day. So it's number of species in, bio in, in uh, genera and um, words in books and all sorts of things, right? Very different, very, very different phenomena. Okay, so then you're off and then it's good stuff and it's a beautiful paper. And you guys should check it out. I know you're excited about that. Um, the solar price. So these other systems were, they're com they're, they had competing objects in them, if you like, cities or words, right? The, there's only some, there's, there's so much space in a book for words and the words are in some sense competing for um, eyeball space. Um, and so, so this is the transition to networks, right? So there was no kind of necessarily, uh, uh, there wasn't a really a, a physical space for those things to live in, right? They weren't in a physical space. Networks are pretty complicated too in terms of physical space, but at least now we've got geometry, okay? So the solar process was the first to think about this kind of rich get, richer phenomena uh, in, in uh, networks. And so these are uh, citation networks. So you have uh, paper, there's a paper, you know, one and paper two and paper three, right? These guys are, are appearing in, in time, let's have time perversely going down here, and you're pointing back in time, right? This is paper, and they're citing each other like this, yeah? And so, right, the fantastic story for science, and this is absolutely fine, I think, is that the mode number of citations um, for a paper is, you know, something like zero or one, right? Or two, right? It's what, because the skewed distribution just decays incredibly. There are some papers that get cited ridiculously, and uh, one is a very common number of citations, especially when you take away self-citations. You kind of—I I, I think the worst I ever saw was pro a paper that had probably had 40 citations at the end, and maybe two-thirds were to the authors. I mean, really, really fantastic work. You know. I mean, you, know, you can sneak a few in there, but wow, um, it's like, dude. Uh, okay, so uh, so that's pretty—that sounds pretty bad, right? That most most stuff that's being produced is not so good. However. You know, science is hard. <laughs> and there are a lot of, uh, you know, all those monks, right? Uh, they had to fall off cliffs and get stuck in holes that they kept digging in and so on. What we really need in science is a lot more science. So we ha have all the great results, right? So you need to be able to publish things that say, do not do this, right? Nothing happened. I didn't get any results. It was a disaster. You know, right? And there are people talking about journal. I, there might be a journal of null results or something. Like that. But it's a very important thing. We have this bias towards, you know, producing great stuff. Yeah. Um, <coughs> but yeah, you, you want to have in this great horrible thing that you're digging through, boarded over rooms, like never enter. Do not, do not, which of course usually means you want to go inside, right? So, <laughs> um, well, everyone else is an idiot, I will figure it out. Um, but yeah, you want signs like do not enter and then seriously do not enter. No, 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 really, I went in there too, it's bad. You know, like, <laughs> Whatever you think you're doing, no, don't do it. Um, usually it's by word of mouth. Um, <coughs> you know, when a big scientist says, oh, that's hard. It's like, oops. All right, so um, I'm, uh, I'm monologuing. So, all right, so, um, so just all, this is in the 70s, 60s and 70s. Again, so I mentioned this the other day, looking at uh, the scientific literature, which is, you know, a great thing to study, of course. From, so this whole thing called the web started in 93, 94, and then we had things like the archive, if you don't know about that, A-R-X-I-V, very clever, um, which is a, originally a physicist repository for preprints, and it's blossomed into, uh, you know, all sorts of people put them now, computer scientists, characters like that, um, mathematicians, 
they stick them in there and they sight each other and so on. So you can, you can, see, you can see this uh, structure. Uh, okay, so Price came up with a term, which the others really, I mean, Rich Gets Richer was not quite, that's a good one, but cumulative advantage, right? So if you're out in front, you've got a better chance of staying in front. And so we can look at this very nicely in these models, these mathematical models. You can see if you're in front early on, whether you stay in front and so on. You can play around with all those sorts of questions. But basically the idea is if you're you know, twice as far, far ahead as someone else, then in some sense you have twice as be a chan uh, better chance of you know, increasing your lot. Um, <coughs> and so very simple uh, mechanism, and we'll see that this actually seems to work, right? So. And I've talked about rich gets richer versus rich gets much richer or rich gets a little bit richer. Right? So, uh, so papers are going to receive uh, citations, at least in this model. It's a, it's a, it is ex a transference of the um, Simon model directly, right? Uh, proportional to the number of citations they have already. So in some sense, that's how big these papers are when you look across somehow, when you look across the scientific uh, landscape which of course is very different. There's all sorts of really nice structures in here, like the uh, half-life of papers, of journals. You, he found, all, he has a beautiful book called um, Big Science. It's either small science, big science, or big science, small science. But it's the idea of scientists becoming kind of, you know, working on a big scale and versus the ones in their coats just doing their little thing and kind of contributing to the big picture. Um, but looking at these big views of how knowledge grows, right? I mean, so we have the rate of scientific production. We have the memory of it, like how far do these things, you know, connect back? I mean, this is just it's really a, I mean, if octopuses, you know, produce science at some point, they'll probably do something like this, which is pretty cool, right? They're our best aliens, by the way, octopuses. <laughs> Every really good alien has tentacles because, yeah. Um, <laughs> but they are, and so it's not, Octopi, octopuses just sounds fun to say, right, okay. So octopi is not, so Jacques Bailey pointed this out there. So um, that's not good because it's, it's octopuses, octopus is Greek and pi is, that's not good, it's, you know, it's Latin. Should be octopodes. So if you're gonna be a really obnoxious about it, you've gotta get the, you know. But then it's just too obnoxious. <laughs> All right, so it's a directed network, right? You can't, this paper can't then cite this way. Um, it's directed in time, I should say, and you can't cite. Well, it's possible that you could, yeah, you could do that. And you just represent it like this. If these ones appear at the same time, and somehow, you know, reviewers point each other, right? That's, that, that happens now. And it can happen much more now in the review process, yeah. Um, <coughs> and there are some papers that, are, there's, I know of one paper that was on the archive for five or six years and then got published in Science, which is pretty spectacular. You know, so I kept fighting for it to, to come through. Um, so in that time, you know, other things happen. Uh, so there are a couple of problems with this. So if you have no citations to your paper, which is obviously what, where you start with, then this proportional mechanism is not going to work because the chance of getting cited is zilch. So he just, little tweak was just to add a plus one, right? So it's the number of citations you have already plus one. And so basically it's a linear mechanism. Um, so yeah, selection we have to think about, but it's not, you know, it's not like the squared power or the half power of the number of citations you have. <coughs> and we'll see that that's actually, those things are harder to kind of imagine happening naturally. They might, but they're harder to imagine happening naturally. There's actually a nice reason for why linear works, apart from just being the simplest thing you could think of, right? All right, so there are lots of other pieces here. So uh, Merton, who's a famous sociologist, uh, who I, I met him just once at Columbia. He was well into his 90s. He lived to a you know, terrific age. Uh, and he did all sorts of uh, interesting things, and he coined lots of terms. So one of them was the Matthew, what he called the Matthew effect. And he was looking actually at scientists, which is a nice you know, data set, a nice field to look at. Uh, and so if you get a bump early on, it turns out to you know, transfer uh, into success later on statistically. Yeah? So, um, so it has this rich gets richer story. So if you, you know, you could all be very smart, but someone just works on the right problem and they get some results and magic happens and they get funding and students come to them. But they, you know, that doesn't mean they're, and it, you know, this is murkier than say sports, right? I mean, sports still has a lot of variability in it. It's not like the very best sports people always rise to the top. We like to think that. Uh, but, but the whole brain thing is much murkier. Okay, so this comes from the Gospel of Matthew. This is where he 
coined this thing. So this is the mechanism that is uh, proposed in the Bible is not actually um, a rich gets richer one. It's more complicated. So this is for everyone that hath shall be given, right? So if you hath, you will hath more. The hath uh, get hathier. Uh, but actually there's more to this, right? So it's but from him that hath not, that also which seemeth to have shall be taken away, right? So it's a the poor get poor. Yes, right? So it's a different mechanism. Yeah? And in fact, it's a little more uh, intense than that. Uh, and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, <coughs> there men will weep and gnash their teeth. So um, that's pretty strong. It is, the, it's old school, yeah, right. Um, okay, so uh, the very tall person I was mentioning the other day suggested that half could be a, a unit of purchasing power. Um, there is, you know, there's a lot of guys in here. The Matilda effect, this is a bad thing. Uh, women's scientific achievements are often overlooked. So that's actually real, you know, documented, of course, and studied. And it's bad. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure whether, it's not his, that's not his thing. I don't know where Matilda comes from. Um, so he, so Merton, out of control. Self-fulfilling prophecy comes from this guy. I mean, you would think that just percolated out of, but no. Role model. So, you know, he, came, he framed these things and said these are things in the real world and or in sociological phenomena, and here's a good term for them. You may use it. Uh, unintended consequences. I mean, these are really, I mean, people use this all the time, especially in systems, actually. It's quite, quite a good thing. Uh, focus group. I called it the focus interview, but it was the, it was the concept and the, and the frame. You're welcome. Uh, and his son won the Nobel Prize in, in economics in, in 97. So this is the, the Black Scholes, actually, the equation that does not quite explain the stock market. Is that the rich get richer too? The smart guys? <laughs> um, I, there is a mechanism, yes, at play there. And it depends on your country's organization, right? Depending on things like uh, death taxes and so on. And, um, you know, if you have the whole king-prince structure, then it's pretty blatant. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, depends what you want to yeah what you uh, choose to do or is chosen for you. All right. Uh, so so then there's a bit of a break in all of this. I mean everyone sort of applauded and said that's very good. Um, as I said, it was published in Science. The work by um, the Solar Price. So you know prominent for sure. Then there's uh, Barabas and Albert. No, you know I did mention the other day, but I'll, 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 I'll have more to say here. Uh, so the thing about the web, and they basically redid Simon's model. Right? It's actually a, a simpler version of it. They studied it in a different way. As I showed you the other day, Simon um, gets out everything from uh, an exponent of 2 to infinity. Right? Gamma equals 2 down to infinity. You've got a really wide, this huge variation in um, outcomes as a function of the innovation rate. So these guys didn't have an innovation rate in this one. They just got k to the minus 3. So k here is the number of uh, links to a website. And they go to k to the minus 3. Which follows from their particular model. That's all very reasonable, but it's one specific thing. So they come up with a term they call it preferential attachment. Okay, so this is, and we'll come back to this later on when we talk about networks. We simply have to. It's one of the big two papers. Uh, this is 99 that appeared in Science. 98, there was a paper in Nature on the small world. Uh, problem and boom, you know, took off from there. Uh, and and really key to this is data was involved, right? Data was involved, just as it was for De Solar Price. But you know, there were a lot of graduate students and monks were in trouble there. This is uh, one graduate student writing some nice code and slurping uh, data sets down. Um, so again, undirected networks. It's not exactly true, but. Um, uh, it's, it's now the web, right? Well, they, they did a few things. I mean, I could, we'll have it later on. I guess I'll have it much later on. But that, they have the web. I know they have the power grid. And they had another thing. So, um, I mean, there's some of the early networks were kind of funny. There were things like the actigraph from IMDB. So if you're in a movie together, then you're connected. It seems like both of these are, like, they have this zero citation problem because they're assuming the only, um, the only mechanism for people mm. finding out about something is through citations. Yeah. But there seem to be other methods, such as yeah. people talking. Yeah. So how does it get broadcast? Like, you so can imagine. It's on a large scale, but not on the small scale. Right. So that's right. So I think you, you could, you, and 
to be honest, there's probably a model out there because there's been so many made. Um, but that's a nice, uh, there are some nice ones for Twitter actually, which kind of have that uh, aspect to them where you somehow, you know, you kind of have a screen, if you like, or some view into the literature and they pop up in front of you. So people are scanning through new stuff. Like reading a journal. Yeah, they're reading journals. Yeah, yeah. So that's a s slightly separate mechanism. And certainly once things take off, you know, this rich gets richer thing is really clear. I mean, it's just, it's impossible for people to overlook papers at some point. You know, it's got a thousand citations like, oh, you know, and, and now it's just ridiculous, right? You just go and look, Google lists them for you, and you're like, okay, I'll read the top one. Because, you know, a million scientists can't be wrong, right? <laughs> of course they can. Actually, a billion people can be horribly wrong. So, um, but you can't help yourself. You have to give credit to that, and you have to look at it. Yeah. Um, so you're right, that would be a, a more sophisticated thing. So this was a reasonable way of just having a very parsimonious model that gets a, yeah, an aspect of it. And so you, what you could say is this little trick, which is wrong, uh, gives you a bit of the, um, a flavor of that. Everyone gets a bump. Okay. Yeah. A little Colbert bump at the start. Too. <laughs> yeah. Set them off. So, right, so payola, or, you know, the music thing, that's, that's what, you're, that's what you're messing around with at the start. You're saying that, or advertising. You're saying that, you know, everyone wants this or whatever. You know, whatever the way you spin it. All your friends are talking about this. The way, you know, right? The, the, or Facebook promotes something. You're kind of saying this thing already has a thousand citations. Or it has zero. And then it starts, you know, it works. It works. And I'll show you very much later on uh, an experiment we did that shows that, yes, that works. But it actually, of course, makes the whole system perform worse. I mean, it makes sense, but uh, we, you know, it's nice to see. Um, <coughs> uh, well, again, I'll elaborate on this later on. Um, it's a bit of a funny selection problem because now we have size. So we didn't have that with the Simon model as it was, as it was uh, you know, put forward, which is you randomly select a person and you go and live in their city. A little weird, you know, but, um, but it was pure randomness which felt good in some ways, right? Otherwise, you'd have to know all the sizes, you'd have to know the sizes of all the cities add them all up, make this very complicated die, and then roll it, and then go and live in Cincinnati, right? That's pretty weird. <coughs> and you roll it again, because you don't want to live in Cincinnati. Um, Santa Fe, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, humans. OK, so um, one way to get around this then, a very nice way to get around this then, is so imagine you have a network. And instead, so you still have random connections, right? And we'll get to this later on about networks. So you randomly connect to a node. But then what you do is, so you're a new guy, and you whoop. Then you also look around at some of their friends, and you glom onto them. So that seems pretty benign, and it shouldn't do anything special. But in fact, friends are weird. And we'll get to this later. Friends are strange, right? So it turns out that, on average, your friends have more friends than you, which is really disappointing. <laughs> Because what you're doing here, this is randomly selecting a node, right? You're just like, here's your big network, and you're finding a node. But if this is now edges, so if you randomly select an edge, and you run along it in one direction, then the chance of, so if this one has tons and tons of friends, the chance of getting an edge that attaches to them is k times their probability, right, of being found anyway. So you get amplified. So it's a, it's a size selection thing. So exactly, so that's where that linear thing actually is kind of sensible. If you're choosing edges, then it's linear, right? Because if there are k ways to get to a node on a network, and you, you first of all, you, you, you see a friendship, for example, and you're like, I want to be friends with those two people. So they will have, um, on average, higher, higher degrees than, than you would expect, and it's linear. All right, we'll come to that later. Um, so that's this thing. So, it's, so this makes sense. So it's randomly uh, connect to a node, and then randomly connect to their, their friends. Yeah. Um, <coughs> you know, and it's sort of true. You know, when you start school or you move to a new place, there's some random stuff that goes along. We'll talk about this later with small world networks. You know, you, there are contexts you like to be in, whatever it is, like sports or religion or something, that bring you into context, and you make some random connections, in a sense, in there. And then you start to you know, move through those networks and, and starts to be more solid after a while. Um, 
What's not in this picture is that the people who want to talk to you to start with are maybe crazy. Right? <laughs> right, they're biased in some way. Yeah. It's like they have no friends already. All right, so that's more complicated. Um, so scale, these are called scale-free. So they have these two terms, preferential attachment. So it's like cumulative advantages, a preferential, what, you know, you preferentially attach to ones that have lots of friends already. And they talked about these things as being scale-free networks. This is a very odd thing. I'll talk about it again. But it's this, we've talked, of course, we've talked about power law size distributions. They're scale-free, right? There isn't a characteristic scale inside them. The only scales that matter are the upper and lower cutoffs. So that's where this term is coming from. But this makes it sound like they're kind of fractals, scale-free networks, right? There's no scale in these networks. And that's a, actually a whole other kettle of fish. The scale, scale free here refers to their, right, you take, you take all the nodes, you measure their numbers of, numbers of friends, and then you plot that, you, right, you make a histogram and plot that distribution. That's, for many networks, not all at all, but um, power, power law size distribution, and um, that's where the scale freeness is, in that attribute of the network. Now what's funny is, no one, and I'll, again, I'll come back to it later on, no one really paid much attention to the the, um, the degree distribution of networks until the late 90s. I mean, a little bit. I really didn't though. All the stuff that was done on random networks in, um, by pure mathematicians, I mean, you know, Edish, right? Crazy, you know, on speed, suitcase, that's it, right? That's all he had walking around the world. Um, you know, really cool stuff, but it, and we'll, we'll do some of it, but it had no, uh, there, was, there were no real degree distributions in them. And it turns out real degree distributions are very weird, right? They're very strange, right? They're not what you expect. If you, if you have a big bag of random networks, you put your hand in and pull one out, you will never get a real one. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's very sim I mean, it's somewhat analogous, let's say that, to uh, the fact that all of the particles in this room can be oriented in all sorts of ways and you get the same kind of macro feeling, right? Like if we move this uh, you know, nitrogen molecule to over here, still the same temperature. We don't notice, right? So that's statistical mechanics. It's all good. But there is equally likely to every configuration one of them where they're all in the corner, which is very disturbing for us. But it's impossible to get to, right? I mean, it's sort of, in some sense, the whole system just goes through all of these possible states, but you'll never access that one. But the net, so the equivalent version for networks is that's, they're the ones you get all the time. You never see these big mix, mix, mixed up kind of states because networks are made. Right, they evolve from something. And that's the big deal, right? Mathematicians aren't interested in how things become things, generally speaking. Um, everyone else is, right? You want to see why did this thing become this thing? And, and there are only certain things that can be generated by general kinds of uh, mechanisms. All right, so that's some, some fun. Um, <coughs> but it gives you the whole history of things. Okay, we're going to talk about uh, Mandelbrot's approach. So we, this rich gets richer mechanism, a lot of randomness, sort of very nice natural kind of thing. This is a completely different approach. Um, so Mandelbrot passed away in 2010, uh, and, and you know I've been giving these lectures for a few years, and so I had to add some things to it. Um, it's quite sad. He's quite a, quite a character, uh, sort of a, a grumpy fellow in some ways, but. Um, Mandelbrot, father of fractals, right? He came up with that term and told everyone that they should be doing this. And, and you know, really, other people had done things, of course. Uh, Richardson famously had measured the, has a paper on the coastline of England, pointing out that it's kind of, a, it depends what ruler you use, right? As to what the length of, you know, what is the length of the, the coastline? Well, that turns out to be a hard problem. Um, so he talked about, hadn't framed it in that way, but, uh, or given it this word fractals. Uh, as he was wont to point out, his name means Arnold Brett, Armand Bread. Um, lots of good things. And of course, so you will have seen this Mandel Bread. He would say this. It's kind of funny. Um, Armand Bread. Um, uh, he worked for many, many years at IBM, actually, uh, research. Yeah. So uh, he, um, you know, the Mandel Bread set, very famous. Okay. That's sort of his, that's the T-shirt. That's what mathematicians try to lure other people into there. Filled with a little bit, you know, little kids, like, come we have pictures. <laughs> kind of a physicist gave them to us, but you know. Anyway, so um, uh, actually, so but again, here's a the problem. These things 
are fantastic, but they're often from, I mean, there are very real ones, of course, but a lot of the ones that are fun to play with are from just kind of mathematical contrivances. So they don't come from anything. So that's the criticism physicists will have. Like why, like, you know, where did that come from? So, and so, you know, that, so you have to talk about how they're made. And so we have them in the real world and there are all sorts of good mechanisms for, for building them. Um, mathematicians don't care. So, okay, so uh, Mandelbrot. So optimization was the approach, which is a very reasonable thing. I mean, obviously optimization goes on to some extent in evolution. It's not perfect. Um, uh, you know, we have um, all sorts of crazy things that evolution's produced, which could not reasonably be said to be optimized. Um, <coughs> there are a lot of trade-offs going on, right? You need robustness, which is something, a big topic we'll talk about soon. Uh, you know, why, why do things not fall apart? Um, and when they fall apart, how, why is it so spectacular? So, very simple idea, language is efficient. Fair enough, that over time, this is, this has been the path of language, that it's, it's a code, right? It's, an, it's, a, it's our way of interacting with each other. Um, <coughs> one of our dominant ways. So of course, so what do we mean by efficient? So you want to get as much information across uh, and as little, for as little cost. So we have to think about how to measure those two things. And so there is a nice way of measuring information. It sounds better than it is in a way, and it's sort of a bad term. Entropy is a better term because no one knows what that means. And that's a better kind of, um, but information sounds like you know, meaning and knowledge. And if you look at Shannon's origi original paper, the first sentence is, it's not about meaning. People don't do that. Um, anyway. It does sound better, yeah. yeah. Entropy does sound mysterious, though. So, you know, they both have their branding uh, attributes. Um, all right. So we'll do this, and we'll, you know, we'll try to follow what Mandelbrot did and see if it works out. So information we'll call H, average cost is going to be C. Um, and there are various ways you could construct this, but if we can maybe try to maximize H over C, if we can construct <coughs> measures of these things, and then maybe we can make a ratio. If they were commensurate, if we could measure these things in the same units, then maybe we could do, well, we could just put a prefactor in H minus something times C. We could do that. Um, you know, you can minim minimize this, right? Cost over H. You can play around with different things. Um, so this is, a, you know, this is a this is a a big question. Uh, certainly for for systems that get to be quite complex, you have really a number of things trading off, and optimality might not come into it um, as strongly as some people might think. Okay, so this is pure optimality. Okay, so. I have to put in here some of the fun back and forth between these guys, right? Because they went out. So uh, the Highlander, I, have to, I am from the 1980s, so I have to share with you um, some of the great things that were produced in that time. Uh, anyone seen this film? Yes. <laughs> oh my god, I was watching the trailer before, which I'm sort of tempted to show you. But um, should we do that? Yeah. Okay. It's really so Sean Connery. It's great. Oh my god. Where is it? Yes. Am I allowed to do this? Yeah. yeah. Alright. But the time comes a man of great power. <laughs> Talk funny Nash, where you from? Lots of different places. A warrior it's of great. incredible strength. You bet that ring you. We've been kingsmen twenty years. Connor McLeod was my kinsman. I don't know who you are. Because you were born different. Men will feel strive to drive you away. <laughs> A man uncertain of his future. What you got here, Brenda? It's a guy who's been creeping around since at least 1700. Not possible. And haunted by his past. It's wrestling. <laughs> what is that? You cannot die, McLeod. I am Colin McLeod, the clown McLeod. I was born in 1518 in the village of Glenfinnan on the shore of the Fox Shield. Oh, fantastic. I am McLeod. Then, 
a hero who is about to face his greatest challenge. You will always be weaker than I. What can you tell me about a seven foot lunatic hacking away with a broadsword at one o'clock in the morning in New York City, 1985? Not much, for he is not alone. <laughs> So great. This is important. So the thing about this film is, there should, sh yes, there should have only been one film because they've made a second and third film. There's like four or five. And then there's a whole TV show. So I actually went with friends to see the second one in Santa Fe. Like it was actually in the 90s, I think. They took a long time. But it, it, the first one ends, it's done, right? Stop it. Well, that's also good. Um, <laughs> Weed and verse, it's all good. Uh, so um, there should really have been only one. Because they, the, the, the structure of this thing is, for whatever reason, there are just a bunch of immortals who have to basically chop each other's head off until there's one, le one left, and then they get the. So it's like Survivor, <laughs> like big time Survivor over 500 years. And um, the best version. Uh, and, and, you know, this guy wins and he, he sort of can see everything. Or like he gets some sort of special power. And that's how it ends, right? But then they start the second film and it turns out they come from another planet. It's just, and they've been exiled. To, it's really insane. It's just a, one of the biggest, like, backstory disasters you've ever seen. The third one sort of ignores the second one. Okay. Yeah, that's a bit of a comeback. Yeah, it's good. Well, that one's Sean Connery back. But the other thing about this is the soundtrack is fantastic. It's Queen. It's Queen. I mean, all of the songs are it's Freddie Mercury. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. So, you know, I don't know what was going on, but they, they really put some effort into that one. <laughs> Acting is terrible. Um, Christopher Lambert, who's just like a forehead, and they say, make your forehead do this. Right? Maybe Queen just came forehead. up with a bunch of music, and they're like, we should put this. For sure, I don't know. I don't know. I just, uh, yeah. I don't know how. It's a good question. Like, did they say? Okay, so I actually say this. Um, so they give only one uh, Highlander film and uh, theory as well. Right? <laughs> so that's the tie in here. Um, uh, but we'd like to argue about this. So yeah, it's a kind of magic. Great. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, I can't play it because we can't afford it. So it's called The Quickening. So that's what this madness is. Um, a little, uh, you, you can sing the song at the top. All right, so. Um, Okay, so these are the papers. This is the one we're about to look at. It's uh, Mandelbrot, an informational theory of statistical structure of languages. Okay, pretty good, not bad. Little, it's definitely better than this, which is on a, you know, this, what, what, what is this nonsense? I will say Mandelbrot is also focused solely on uh, language. He doesn't have that broader uh, story that, that Simon does. Um, <coughs> Could have got photos of them when they were younger, I think. Uh, so let's see. So. This is 53, 55, and then four years later, you have Manabrat comes out, it's just like, boosh, you know? Kinda, you know, he's, he's not happy. A note on a class of skew, skew distribution functions, analysis and critique of a paper by Simon. So he says Simon's name in the title. It's like, you, I'm calling you out. Come on. <laughs> Simon's like, okay, my brain is incredibly big. So some further notes on a class of skew distribution. It's just really not lifting the title up at all, but it's just, you know, okay. Let's see, so some of them are in, so things like this. So this is information and control. Like, so they are published in yeah. journals, you see. Okay. These really could have been blog posts. <laughs> Tweets. Tweets. <laughs> but it took a while, and they put some stuff in there. Uh, then we have 61, final note, on a class of skew distribution functions. <laughs> and then 61, reply to final note. <laughs> final break. So now he's got his name in there as well. He's like, okay. Uh, postscriptum to final note. <laughs> it's really fantastic. And this is the last one. Reply to uh, Dr. Mandelbrot's postscriptum. So it's just ridiculous. <laughs> really magic. And so I've got, I think I have them all. Let's see. Are they all there? Where were they living at this time? Mandelbrot would have been at um, IBM. Um, 
uh, you know, north of New York City. Um, what's Vermont? Yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, Simon was at CMU, Carnegie Mellon. They never got together and had a fist fight. I don't know about that. It's a very good question. Like it would have been more efficient for them to just like, call each other and be like, hey, I have this idea. <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, they did. Yeah, it's all. Oh, so these are information control. I guess I don't have them. There'd be little links to them here. Pretty great, great stuff. Um, so I have some quotes. Oh, I, I do have this, right? I mean, I have a couple of quotes. I am a model. I have inside me blood of kings. So we shall, we shall restate in detail, right? Our objections, blah, blah, blah. And he's calling it the Pareto Yule Zipf distribution, just to be clear that everyone's involved. Objections are quite valid, irrespective of the sign of P minus one. Um, so what he said was irrelevant. Uh, there's a new set of objections, like his early objections, these are invalid. So that's, this is kind of the tone of the thing. I have a, um, this guy, he's kind of a, he's a bit of a hero of my children many years ago. Um, a lot of great lines by Plankton. He's sort of one of the great supervillains, actually, I think. Um, there you go. So. That was fun. So let's see how uh, what Matterbrot did. All right. Why he thinks his thing is so much better than Simon's. And eventually, and I'm not sure if we'll get there today, we'll, we'll see who the winner is. <coughs> well, if there is. Okay, so uh, all right, so language is N words, so it's very very much it's very much about language, right? Uh, and straight up we'll have this probability P thing, right? Okay. Uh, and, and this is obviously a silly thing that's going on with all of these models that, are, right, that words are appearing randomly, um, <coughs> which is how we think about when we, when we measure information f of, a, of a text. We, we think about, um, we, we don't think about correlations between words. And, I mean, we can do more complicated things, but the raw version of information holds that essentially, you know, what's the minimal kind of, um, uh, information or, or, or cost, in a sense, to encoding uh, a series of symbols given they appear with certain frequencies, right? So if something appears half the time, then you don't need a long, this is what we'll have, you don't need a very long uh, representation of it. It would be silly to have, you know, something that's 10 bits long. So you have a very short one for that. Ones that appear ra very rarely, you can give them a longer code. So we have to think about how that should work. Um, <coughs> actually, I'm not sure how well Morse code works. It might, I think I think I looked at that at some point. I think it's not bad. <coughs> I don't think Morse was an engineer, actually. Morse, this is in Glick's book. Morse was a, is that right? Do you remember reading about that? Morse was a, like a liberal arts guy running around in Africa or something. I don't know, it was something kind of funny. Yeah. There you go. His wife died or something, right? He was going, he was doing an art. He was okay. doing an art exhibit and then because he couldn't communicate quickly enough with his wife, she was, he, he was in like Boston and went to Washington for something in the museum and didn't hear in time that his wife was sick, so he was like, I'll, I'll come and see you when I'm done, and then by the time he got there, she was dead. And that was the motivation? I think that he wanted to wow. set his life to that. Hmm. Um, Maybe I'm dreaming. Yeah, no, we should look this up. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's an excellent story. And so. Um, uh, but I know, yeah, he wasn't, uh, you know, sort of running around looking like Einstein or something, but turned out to produce a thing. All right, so really we're going to get down to the details here because the, his theory is built on an a, um, alphabet-based language, right? Not all languages like this. Uh, so M letters in our language. Uh, and <coughs> he will say that the optimized, and this is fair enough, you know, if it's been optimized, then... Uh, the highest probability ones will be the shortest. Now, this is quite complicated, and not, you know, if you look at real languages, it's, it's, there has been some funny things recently about this. But, um, but basically, this is a good. Pl it's not a bad plan, right? Okay, and you could talk about syllables and things like that, phonemes and so on, right? Okay, so word cost is going to be uh, the length of the word plus a space, right, basically. So it's gonna, that's how much it's going to cost to put out, lay our word out, because we can imagine sending it through a, um, through, um, you know, a, a channel. Uh, obviously, this didn't really matter for Simon's model, right? This is like flavors of elephants. They didn't really, wasn't really an issue. Um, 
Obviously, this is true that real words don't, this is what's going to happen. We're going to have every, we're going to have 26 words of length 1, and then 26 times 26 of length minus the repeated ones. 26 choose. Okay, 26 times 25. Um, of, uh, of the uh, of words of length 2, which is not true, right? It's about 100 acceptable length 2 words in English in Scrabble, depending on which, uh, if you use international or US, yeah, right? Like you can use za, I mean, and qi, and just what's going on. What else? No, I'm saying qi is awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the best. Yeah, kind of annihilates the whole point. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, a few good ones. Um, you know, so slip uh, managed so from Arabic, a couple of good ones like qat for a bush, right? That's good. You can do some bad things with that. Anyway, all right. So um, x obviously is, you know gets too many, too many points. Actually, so right, the Scrabble, it's, it's the sort of same kind of word counting thing, right? I think it was like the front page of the New York Times, counted up how many times the, uh, forgotten his name, the guy who invented Scrabble in the 30s, counted up how many times letters appeared, and, and that's how he assigned the scores. Yeah. All right, <coughs> so, uh, all right, so we don't get all of these letter sequences. Maybe real words follow this pattern. I could put some stuff in here about that. If I have a pen and a brain. A brain pen. Um, word lengths, yeah. So you could say, well, all right, it's not all of them, but maybe it's like you know, a tenth of them, and then a tenth, you know, like it's roughly true. Um, words can be encoded this way. So even if you just, these aren't really how the words work, you could think of them being encoded in that way. And then you could, you know, fit in with our, you could just be uh, upset and say, stop talking. All right. Okay. So. Let's think about it just a little bit. So we're going to try to get out a cost, how much it costs to send these things, and how much uh, information is in them. All right. So let's imagine we have. So our um, these are our, our words are going to be in bits. Right, the simplest thing we can do. So the first word is one, then one zero one one. Right, we're just counting up in binary, and the length of these guys. This is just you know, showing you a very simple thing. One two two three three. Um, <coughs> Right? This is a, the first time you get four, and we'll have a bunch of these until we get to five. Right? So they go up slowly. And the observation is that um, if we take one plus uh, log base two of i, then that's a, that's a very rough approximate approximation for word length. Right? It's obviously wrong in between the switches. between. Right? So it's exactly right here. It's exactly right here. It'll be exactly right for eight. Um, <coughs> Sorry, for five, six, that would be right for those things. But it's a decent approximation in there. So it's working exactly at multiples of two, right? Which is, yeah, what I was saying. Um, OK, so uh, that's this thing. So the two, so multiple of, of two, so two to the power of k. Sorry, powers of k, powers of two. So two to the k, the length of that is k plus one. Um, so we're going to use this approximation, right? Here it is. Oh, yeah. It's a bad thing. Evil. Um, so then if we have m letters instead of two letters, our word length is going to go like 1 plus log m i. Right. Right, this, is a, this is a language with two letters plus a space. OK, sort of. All right. So this will be their cost. This is a measure of cost. And we don't really have to, we won't have to worry about this one, but basically the cost is going up very slowly, logarithmically, with um, the index of the word. Yeah? <coughs> Super exciting. Okay. <coughs> cost of the word. So as I said, um, we could add it. Yeah, all right. We could add our space, plus one. Uh, sorry, that's, that's a plus one over here. That's fine. It's not a big deal. Um, <coughs> well, it will be a bit of a... Okay, this one is not a big deal. This, this one here. This is going to be an interesting piece here, actually. It's a Mandelbrot. It's a, it's a fishy little thing to have done, but we'll see, see how that works. Okay, so we could just get rid of this fixed cost and say that cost is going up like this. All right. We're going to have ratio of information to cost, so that's right. <coughs> hmm. I wonder what would happen if we kept that in. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah. 
And we, can, we, we don't have to use, we can, make a, we can give ourselves a much better uh, base for the, algor uh, the logarithm. So log of whatever this blob is here, right, can be rewritten as log base E, which we love, uh, if we divide by log E M. So you, this, this is always these, one of these horrible things to think about. But um, if you, you can sort that out for yourself and make sure that that's true. Uh, but it's, it is, yeah, so logs just differ by this, um, by a, a ratio. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the total cost, all right, so then we can just say, all right, fine, no problem. So it's going to be proportional to the natural log of i, I plus 1. So the plus 1 seems benign, but it's going to matter. And it was there for the space. Um, <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so total cost, uh, then it's just, so, so we have to weight it by the probability that uh, the ith word appears. So it's going to be sum from i equals 1, there are n words, pi, whatever this cost is, we've messed around with it enough. Uh, and it's going to be proportional to, because it's all proportional to um, this probability of i, uh, probably of the ith word, times log of i plus 1. Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's a nice bit of messing around. All right, that's what Mandelbrot did sneaky back of the envelope kind of stuff. Okay, so that's our cost. All right, so entropy. We use the, the classic Shannon's entropy uh, measure, sometimes called uncertainty. Uh, and I'll explain this if you haven't seen this guy. So again, there's a weighting of P sub i here. So it's really the average of this quantity in here with a minus sign. So it's really the average of um, minus uh, log 2 of p sub i. And the minus 1 can be put up there. So this is really uh, the average of this quantity in here, right? This is whatever blob we put here. If it's a frog, then we're checking the average of a frog. This is log 2, 1 over p sub i, right? The minus 1 goes up here. So this is the thing we're averaging. So we have to think about what that is. So event, uh, apparently von Neumann said you should call it entropy because no one knows what that means. Yeah. What are we measuring here using the entropy? Are we measuring the cost or, or the gain? For the this is supposed to be the, this is a measure of the information content, right? So it's like the number of bits per word. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So information is a bit of a funny thing, right? So it's maximized by randomness. So if you just say ook, 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 right? You just have one word, then that's... It's like ice, right? It's a very low information, low entropy situation. Because to encode that, it's really easy, right? You don't have to do anything to encode it. To encode randomness is actually hard. So entropy turns out to be not a, it's a, it's a beautiful measure, but it's, not, it's actually not a good measure for complexity, for example, right? Because random, like, you know, is, is uh, maximal entropy. Um, so that's going to be the cost, right? So this is when we talk about the cost, so this, the cost of the longer word, at least in this formulation. But then in terms of, it um, doesn't take too, really too much, but in terms of the information content, like how much it takes to encode, like, so you've got all your words, right? Then if you want to encode it into zeros and ones and so on, which one, so if, if cigarette is every second word, then actually you can encode it very simply. Right, because you can just say, oh, we'll just call that one, and then everything else is going to start with a zero. Yeah, that would distinguish it. It's kind of a bad situation if that's what's happening. And if sig is incredibly infrequent, then you might as well reserve a whole bunch of bits for that. Right, look at a really long string, because it's not going to happen much. And you're not, yeah, right, right. Okay, so, um, so yeah, this is the statement. So this thing is going to be the average number of bits to encode each word. All right, we move away from the language and turn into zeros and ones. Um, and it's based exactly on the frequency of occurrence. So this is what I did here. So this is minus log, it's log 2 of 1 over pi. So it's the, um, 
if you, if you do this perfectly, right, and it's random, and you're expecting that th these sets of words you're going to be sending through, you're going to be sending through this channel randomly. Um, this is, in a sense, the number of bits you need to distinguish this word from all other words, right? So in this case, if if it appears half the time, then you really just you just need one bit, right? So log two of one over a half is log two of two, which is one, and that that gives us the right thing. So we need one bit. So the word that, so if something appears half the time, like cigarette, right? Then you just say, we'll start, we'll just give that a one. And then if we see a zero at the start of a word, that means it's not that. And then we have some choice after that. Zero, one, and zero, one, um, zero, zero. And they'll start branching off into other things. <coughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it, that's, that's right, that's the classic um, way of doing this. I mean, yeah, that's all you need. According to some people, too, you know, the whole universe is zeros and ones, right? Yeah, then you have to get into um, context, I would think. Oh. Yeah, and so we actually have some really nice work um, in our group that attempts to get at that. Um, because, yeah, you need to look at the, the context and you need to, so you'd have things like uh, conditional probabilities, right? So does this word functionally behave like this word? Now, that still doesn't you know, mean you've, you've got the same meaning, right? It just means functionally, at least, they won't behave the same way. Um, it's a really tough problem, I think. Yeah, I mean, totally, we want to get to extracting meaning in stories from text. Yeah, I mean, we have this thing where we're extracting emotion from text, but we'd love to get to the next levels. And we are getting to some, all right, we have the project story finder. I mean, we are trying to get it, yeah. <coughs> Super interesting, I mean, language is fantastic. It's just absolutely great. And we're in a great time because it's all over the place. You know, you can just shovel it into computers and play around with it. <coughs> it's not very poetic, but it is incredibly, incredibly interesting, right? And it matters deeply. Okay, so NSA is having a great time. All right, so let's see. <laughs> Hi. Um, <coughs> so if something appeared 1 in 64 times on average, then you'd need six bits for that. Or, you, or it would be smart to use six bits. It would be silly to use one bit. It would be silly to use 100 bits. So you'd be kind of hitting the sweet spot if you have six bits for that guy. Right? It might be one, zero, 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 one, one, whatever it is. And you know that as you go down there and you reach a space, it's that guy. It's this word over here. Okay? So that's a sort of a, you know, a very rough understanding of these things. Obviously, these probabilities aren't all powers of one over a half. Somewhere in between, so it works out. You generalize it a little bit more. So again, we'll do this uh, sneaky thing. So we, we had log two of pi. We can replace that with uh, natural log of pi divided by this conversion factor. And just say this is some constant times pi log pi. The minus is very important out here. All right, so, and g is some factor. So basically, we have information is the sum. It's the weighted sum, some constant of a natural log, okay? So we did have log two, but we can make it natural log because uh, we we'll want to differentiate things. <coughs> That's what's going on. So we okay with this? Ask more questions. Horribly upset. Okay. Right, so what do we do? We're gonna set this thing up. It's got all these variables in it, P1, P2 through Pn. Right, these probabilities. Um, <coughs> and uh, we're trying to minimize cost divided by uh, information. All right, we're doing that. Yep. And the constraint that we have, we do have this constraint. The probabilities have to add to 1. So that suggests what? It's an optimization problem with a constraint. 
And there are things we can differentiate. French person. You what? Lagrange, Lagrange. Lagrange multipliers. All right, so we'll get to them. Okay. Um, <coughs> if you haven't seen it, it's totally good. So shorter words are cheaper. That's the tension that's happening in here. Uh, but longer words are more informative. Yeah. You need the short words. They help glue things together. Uh, but these are the ones that will tell you what's going on. Of course, it happens at all scales. All right, so what does this look like? This horrible thing. Um, <coughs> Lagrange multiplies this is how you set them up. You make this big, fat function, which is the, has the quantity that you want to minimize, or the, the function you want to minimize, plus the uh, multiplier, lambda, so this is just some number, times the constraint function. <coughs> So if you haven't seen these, well, I guess you are now. But the idea is that uh, um, there's some constraint, right? So your system has to live on this line. And then maybe here, if you like, here, are the, here is where the function itself is equal. And there's some gradient in the function, right? So it's, maybe it's getting smaller in this direction. It's getting larger in this direction. And what we're doing with this funny equation is that we're actually trying to find these endpoints because we have to live on this curve so what you want is when the um, normals to your constraint curve and the overall terrain if you like of the of the um, of the uh, function you're trying to minimize or maximize match up so here it's no good right these guys are like this and like this so that means you could actually you could move around on the curve right so you could move around on the curve until you get a matching them up so you don't want to be here or anywhere else. There are actually just these two points. So one way of doing that is saying, if you take the, right, the, the um, differentiate these guys together, you want, this is essentially saying you want them to be proportional. If you differentiate this thing, set it equal to zero, that means you want the, the norm of, the, the normal of both of these things to be pointing in the same direction. They have to be proportional to each other. If you need to refresh, you can check these things out later on. Um, but you know, ultimately, it is you know understand it. But ultimately, the procedurally differentiating some stuff with some trickiness, of course. Okay, so we have this function. It's the cost divided by um, the information, and the constraint function. You know, usually we construct it so that it's equal to zero, just because that seems nice. So we can do that. We'll say that the sum of the probabilities minus one equals zero, which is true. It's not so. It's not going to be true away from this curve, but we allow ourselves to kind of roam around everywhere in this space, and then uh, we'll have to rein ourselves in at the end and say this has to be true. But we'll just let it be a, a function by itself. But we want that to be true. I guess I can fix that. Yeah. So in a sense, this is for later on. Not in a sense. It is for later on. OK, so that's going to be an assignment three question. Fine. <coughs> Just psyched about that. Uh, but it's partial derivatives with respect to all of these guys. They're all just p sub i, so you just do one of them. right? You, you only have to think about doing one of them. And you end up with this. And so this is where we can finish today. So um, <coughs> you through an enjoyable process, You'll end up with uh, that these probabilities, for this thing to really work out nicely, right? You'll end up with these probabilities of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So again, they're decaying. They're ordered. Uh, turns out to have this funny looking prefactor, which has some of the things in it, the information and the cost. OK, that's fine. This will actually turn out to disappear. Um, but basically, you end up with a j plus 1, right? Pj, j plus 1 minus an exponent. So it's a power law, decay. Total excitement, right? Of course. Um, <coughs> power law appears. And this guy, this is set up like Zipf's law, right? Because it's rank, right? J is a rank. One, two, three, four, five, six, even though it says probability. 
It's one, two, three, four, five. Right? It's, it is the size of them. Because we're thinking about words, right? So it's the frequency, it's the abundance of the first one, the second one, the third one, right? So the, how, what's its abundance? What's the abundance of of? What's the abundance of um, cataclysmic? Or um, <coughs> other funny, less common words. Okay, uh, chartreuse, there you go. So uh, that's, a, that's actually a zip exponent. Right? It's a rank distribution. So it depends on whatever these quantities kind of popped out to be, Does it, you know, this, these things. So G was a little, G was back here, this little guy. Yeah. One over log two. Right? But it will turn out that you'll be able to, without even knowing what G is, you'll be able to find out what this uh, blob is what this ratio is, right? You don't need to find out what H is exactly or C is exactly. You'll be able to determine this ratio. Yeah. Um, okay. So I said that, you know, we have this. So you can actually, so there's some sneaky things to do where you can figure out lambda in terms of G, C, and H. It does have, you have to use that constraint, right? The probabilities have to add up to one. So. That will be in there. And it turns out that you get this. So if this, so if it probably decays as uh, j plus 1 to some power, now we just, now we have to normalize it, right? Now we use our constraint, actually. So now we have to normalize it. There's some sneakiness in here, and now we know we can normalize it. Uh, j equals 1, 2, 3, and in principle, n, right? It goes on forever. So this is, uh, so how do we do that? So 1 is, the, so the sum of the probabilities has to be 1. It's this guy, whatever. So this, this is actually going to tell us what our exponent is. It will, in principle, be a function of n. We could let n go to be very large. Uh, and in fact, um, this is what happens. So as n goes to infinity, you get the Riemann zeta function appearing, which is exciting for mathematicians. But it, <laughs> it's, um, it's uh, not to be too worried about. Uh, but basically, it just is the, the Riemann zeta function. And what's happening is you're getting one equals the sum from j equals 1 to infinity of uh, j plus 1 to some exponent. So it's starting at j equals 1, which is really 2, right? So it's starting at 2. So we could say, um, let's put i equals j minus 1. And then we would get that this whole thing is the sum of uh, from i equals 0. So if j starts at 1, right? 1 minus 1 is 0, so i equals 0 to infinity. And j plus 1, uh, that means that we just have, uh, what did I do? Nope. i equals j plus 1. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So good. So, so I start where? Oh, I've blown my brain out. Um, so j equals 1, so this will be i to the minus alpha. That's what we want. And when we start at 1, yeah, I starts at 2. Thank you very much. So this is almost the Riemann zeta function. My zeta exploded. Zeta of um, alpha, uh, which is really the sum from 1 to infinity. And when i equals 1, this is a 1, right? It's 1 to the minus alpha. So we're subtracting 1 off it. So 1 equals zeta of alpha minus 1. So we put the 1 on the other side. And then we have, that's our constraint. So zeta of alpha, or this blob, is equal to 2. So then we use something like you know, MATLAB or that other thing that people use. Um, I can't say the name. Um, and it will give you this. Alpha is 1.73. which is a bit strange, actually. It's greater than 1, which is a bit high, right? So, uh, OK, so then we back off a little bit. This is what Mandelbrot did. Again, this gives you a very specific output. It's different to Simon's model. Simon's model gave a, a tunable thing, a really nice one. We had a micro story. The innovation rate corresponds to a, an exponent. Um, here we have this, this fixed exponent here. So. Um, you can mess around with the cost function. So instead of j plus 1, when that 1 again was for the space, put j plus a, and then see if it matters. Right? See if we can, yeah. now we're just like, OK, let's, 
let's, let's mess with it and see if we can get the right thing. Uh, so you'd want to get, so this is, right, the classic kind of zip result is one. Alpha is one or gamma is two for the size distribution. So it's a bit high. Um, and, and so there's a nice problem to work on here where we try to see if we can mess with Mandelbrot stuff to get it to work. Um, I think really in his paper he doesn't quite say that it doesn't really work. But anyway, he does do this actually. He messes around with it a little bit. So we'll see if uh, so you guys can see how well that works. But basically, as you increase A, you do decrease alpha. And the question is, can you kind of reasonably... Right, so you have to increase the cost of the space, which seems a bit odd. <coughs> but that's the way it will, will work. All right, so here's just a little summary. We can go, we'll, we'll have a few pieces to add on Tuesday, and then we'll get on to um, percolation, robustness, all sorts of things. But um, so it's a reason, very reasonable thing, right? Optimization is obviously at play in some way. Um, uh, lots of other things happen, right? Um, there's cost, there's robustness, there's all sorts of other things being playing out in a system that are fighting against it being perfect. Things are changing, the environment's changing. Um, it's a bit of a funny argument. It doesn't generalize obviously beyond language. Um, he's not around to abuse me for that. Uh, and it, the cost definition is a bit soft, right? But it got out of power law, which is you know, an achievement. And we're like, yes. <laughs> but I have a power law. You don't like my power law? Okay, so then I'll, I'll have some uh, abusive bits at the end uh, that I'll start the next, uh, next lecture off.